I, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, Manager Ozegi, uh, Jim Grody, Ebed Andrews, and uh, Kuwata-san. What I'm going to talk about today is um, none of the application of nanocarbons uh, in nonlinear optics and uh, in 3D holographic uh, display. Uh, two examples I will give. The first example, we are using nanocarbon as a sensitizer so that they absorb light and generate charge carriers. And that's for the application in 3D holographic display. The second application is the use of uh, nanocarbon as a nonlinear material, pretty much as a saturable absorber in mode locking fiber lasers. And I'm going to show you some of the application of that. So these are the two examples. So let's start with the first example, and that's the nanocarbon for. 3D holographic display and telepresence. What's the state of the art in 3D? If you go to companies like Zebra Imaging or Serial, you see actually beautiful 3D displays that uh, are large size, human size, and uh, they are actually very good quality. You don't really need any eyeglasses to uh, see them. Uh, it looks like you can actually go and touch them, uh, and it's, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty nice. The problem with uh, those displays are that uh, the, uh, they are not dynamic, they're static. So you print them, you put them on the wall, you can look at them. So uh, what we came into is trying to replace these with dynamic holograms something that you can actually um, change and you replace the image, erase an image with another one, so basically update it. So the materials that you use for this technology, they have been around. Uh, these are for a static 3D holographic display. You have silver halides, you have photopolymers, you have dichromated gelatin, and the way it works, for example, for a photopolymer, as you put light on it, and the material polymerizes, so it changes its state, and therefore it's difficult to change it back. That's why they're static. And what we are focusing on is on uh, materials that are dynamic, and these materials are called photorefractive materials or photorefractive polymers, and they're based not on polymerization, but on moving electrons around. So you generate charge carriers, you move them around, and then therefore you can go back and redistribute it and therefore get it, make it dynamic. That's the whole process. Photorefractivity has been around for the last 35, 40 years. There's a lot of experiments people have done on this uh, back in the 70s and 80s, four way mixing and so on. And the process is very simple. You have two laser beams that are interfering on the material and generating a interference pattern, bright regions and the dark regions. So if you look at the intensity as a function of distance, you're gonna see that there are bright regions here and dark regions here. So if your material is photosensitive, where there is light, Light gets absorbed, charge carriers get generated. And you can see that plus and minus charges are generated in the bright regions. And if your material is photoconducting, one of those charge carriers moves from the bright region to the dark region and gets trapped there. Uh, in organics, the positive charges have larger mobility so they're the ones that move from the bright to the dark and get trapped. So as a result of that, you generate a space charge. Pluses and minuses are separated from each other, which uh, this is space charge through the Poisson equation would give you a space charge field. And this is space charge field would give rise to an index modulation 
if your material is electro-optically active. So this index modulation that is resulting from this process is referred to as photorefractive effect. And this is the effect that we are using for our displays. So you see that for this process to work, you're going to have various, you're going to need various properties of material. It has to be uh, charge carrier generation, so photosensitive. It has to be photoconducting. It has to have electro-optic properties. And all of that can be obtained in polymers through a, what's called the guest host approach, where you start with a host material, which is a photoconducting uh, polymer matrix, and then you add different uh, guests to it to get the properties that you need. So for example, we start with the PATPD as the matrix, and then we start adding elements. Nanocarbon here is added as a photosensitizer so that charge carriers could be generated by shining light on it. And then you, add, you make the material electro-optically active by putting different chromophores, nonlinear chromophores in there. And finally, in order to uh, make the system a bit uh, easier to align when you apply electric field so that the charges uh, the, the, the molecules are, are oriented, so you get, you get the, uh, the, the electro-optic property that you need. Uh, we put these electro-optic um, chromophores in there and the plasticizer to, uh, to make it easier to do. So that's basically the four components that we need for this. And after you do all of that, you can actually get large area uh, plastic materials, basically, that uh, you could use to do 3D display holographically. And these are, this is an example of the type of uh, chromophores that we put in, sensitizer, charge transfer, all of these uh, electro-optic chromophores and plasticizer. Okay, so let's do that. Then after you make the material, you put it between two transparent electrodes, ITO, apply electric field across it to line up the molecules, and then you test it by doing four-way mixing with two beams coming in, uh, forming the uh, uh, interference pattern, and then you test your material by looking at the diffraction efficiency, how much of the probe light gets diffracted in the direction of the one of the beams. The larger that diffraction efficiency, the brighter is your display. So measure that uh, diffraction efficiency, and uh, this next chart, shows the diffraction efficiency as a function of the field. You see that pretty much all of the light gets diffracted into that first order. And however, the material is not done yet. If you increase the field even more, the index diffraction becomes larger, the index change becomes larger, so that you transfer light to the other beam. And in fact, you get several of these modulations. You get index changes on the order of 0.01, and so that's pretty large for these systems. So, and also, if you look at the dynamics of it, you see a few millisecond is the time that you need to actually do this, so it's um, pretty, ra pretty rapid. So now, how do we do our 3D display? Again, the same concept, a reference beam and a uh, object beam. So the, the uh, image that you would like to display is actually encoded on the object beam through a special light modulator. So they interfere and form. This uh, image is stored into in that index, index of refraction change that I was mentioning. And then a reading beam comes in and it's shown the observer can see that. So for example, if the image is a motorcycle like this, that image is, uh, is encoded into the uh, object beam through the SLM. And then you look at the interference pattern. All you see is just a bunch of bright and dark spots at the interference pattern. It doesn't show you much. But if you send the reading beam, you can actually recover your image. And the viewer can see the, the uh, image that you wanted to display in 3D. OK? So the. Uh, Hardware is very much following the schematics I was, I was talking about. This is the riding beam that goes through the SLM and then gets interfered with the uh, reference beam. 
and then you can read it out later on. If you write a meme, you can also make color by doing angle multiplexing, and so uh, you can have three different colors in the process as well. Okay, so let me show you an example of a uh, image that we make. Here is a 30 centimeter side by side, so a 17 inch display. Um, and you can see in real time it's being written. Of course, I'm trying to show a 3D image on a 2D screen. So the way we show it is by moving the images still and you move the camera around and therefore you see that it, the images look like it's moving, uh, which shows that there's different perspectives or different views that you are seeing here and it's colored. So as you move around the image, you can see different, so it's a building with a helicopter on the top. So it's pretty much, uh, as you noticed, you can write it not in a video rate, but at least you can write it in a matter of a few seconds on a large area display. Okay, so that's the process, and it works. Now, we have made different type of images uh, and uh, erase it, you can rewrite it, and you can do that many times. Different images, different colors, and so on. Uh, blue, green, and the mixtures of those that have been done. So, what's the difference between what we do and what you can see in a uh, 3D cinema or 3D TV? If you go to Avatar, for example, uh, they give you these glasses to wear because there's only two views, one for one eye, one for the other eye. So, uh, first of all, in 3D TV or cinema, you, there's an eye wear that eyeglass is required, while in our technology is holographic, so you don't really need any, any eyeglasses. Uh, in 3D TV and cinema, there is only two views, one for each eye, but in our case, there's hundreds of views, more than 100 views you can see, so you can actually imagine that you can uh, see the whole object 360 degrees if you wish to do so. Also, there's what's called divergence accommodation conflict that exists in 3D cinema. That means some people that go to the movie, 3D movie, they get dizzy after a while because of this uh, 3D, con uh, 3D because of this divergence accommodation conflict, and so they have to take uh, remove their eyeglasses. Uh, while there's not a, not such a conf conflict in the 3D, so you can see that. So ultimately, what you imagine of having is a system like this, that are people sitting around the table interacting through this display. And so the person sitting on the right side of the table and the left side of the table would see different views of the object. That's the whole concept that we are looking at. So you can basically have these 3D systems either in a portrait, which is like a, like a uh, movie or TV, TV or cinema that you can go around and you can see different perspectives, while, for example, if you are in a 3D movie now, the person who's sitting on the left side of the theater and the person who's sitting on the right side of the theater, they see the same, the same image. Here, there's gonna be different, and you're gonna see different views uh, from different sides. Uh, in order to show that, what you need is what's called a full parallax, as opposed to uh, horizontal parallax. In this case, the, the holographic pixels are just like what I'm showing here, um, is, is basically a 2D array of pixels. In this case, the number of pixels, holographic pixels, is like n square, while in um, horizontal parallax, you have uh, pretty much uh, cylinders that, uh, that they're like n. So the number of uh, pixels goes like n square, but it gives you a lot more hogles, which means that uh, you're gonna have a hard, harder time or longer time it takes to write it. But we have put systems together to actually write those full parallax systems. And this is an example of that. And this is uh, a full parallax uh, operation and the pictures that are taken from that image from different sides. So a building, uh, if you, 
If you are on this side of the building, you see the front side. If you are this side of the building, you see the back side. And again, left and right, you see different perspectives showing that by going around what we call it the walk around observation demo, by walking around the object, you can see different perspective of it without any uh, eyewear. So we have put together our 3D holographic system. There's a lot of software that requires in this, in this case. Uh, it's called the visualization management system that converts uh, the, the uh, 3D models into holographic data. So an observer sitting at the desk could choose the image that they want to see uh, and then push a button and that data goes through the visualization system and gets printed on the 3D uh, printer. So they change, they want to change to a different, different view or they want to zoom on something, they can do that. They, they zoom it and then they can click a button and you can get the view, completely new view of the, of the, of the image. So this system is uh, running and is operational. Ultimately, the goal is to have something that is uh, replacing your uh, iPads and uh, uh, making it uh, 3D holographic. Uh, we are sort of trying to miniaturize the system. The, use, the system used to be on a four by eight optical table, but now is a two feet by two feet by two feet system. Of course, it's a far cry from an iPad, but still going in the right direction. Uh, so in this case, uh, in order to start miniaturizing, uh, we are replacing all of the refractive optics, all of the lenses with what's called holographic optical elements so that uh, is the, the lens is nothing but a piece of glass with uh, some gelatin on top of it or photopolymers that are designed to do the functions that you need. So this uh, systems are starting to be built and put together. So one of the applications that we have in mind was, uh, we came from a, a movie that was more than 30 years ago, Star Wars. In this case, Princess Leia comes in from a different, uh, basically is projected from a different planet uh, by R2-D2 and is uh, crying for help. This was uh, science fiction. And so the question was, can we actually do this now with the technology that we have? Uh, so we want to project an object from a one place into another place in 3D holographically. Can one do that? So in order to show such a system, in reality, you're going to need the ca to capture the images. That means in order to capture the image, you need to have various cameras put around. Each camera would uh, represent a view from that object. Then you need to transmit it from A to B, uh, from one planet to another. And because of the fact that our internet system is not that good yet, uh, we tried to do it from one room to another room. So the object was in one room, and we connected it uh, to the other room through fiber optics, and uh, basically used the, uh, the internet to transfer the data from A to B. And then when it gets to the other room or uh, to, the, to the other place, you display it using the 3D display that I just showed you. And finally, ultimate goal is to be able to control uh, that 3D display. So this with, with uh, basically gesture control with your hands and so on that, that I'm going to show you in a minute. So this work, this, this uh, experiment was done and was published in Nature about more than a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, the, the experimental results are shown here. So we used only 16 cameras and made a 45 degree angle. So it's not full 360, but imagine if you would have made the lar the, a larger number of cameras, we could have basically had the whole object in there. You can see in this case, one of our researchers is sitting in one room and is being displayed in another room. And again, by moving the camera around, it shows a 3D view. The object is 
is sitting there and is not moving, but as you can see, as the camera goes around, it shows different views of that person, so it shows the different perspectives that are being recorded and being displayed. So in order to also show that the uh, system is completely updatable, uh, we move that person off the chair, put another researcher there, and uh, try to do the same thing with the next person. And that will come up in just a second. Uh, so as you see, it's real time is being written. And now the next person is coming in. And again, the same story. You can see that uh, we can view that person in 3D in the next room. So this uh, was, was shown, and the uh, experiment was successful from that point of view. But as you can imagine, there's a large amount of data that we have to manipulate. In this case, it was simpler because it was one color. It wasn't video rate. It was just a few seconds for each image. But if you really want to go to full parallax 3D, you see the number of uh, data you have to process and display a lot of data. Uh, for example, only for a 17-inch uh, display, which is 300 by 300, you're going to need about 2 terab terabits of information that has to be processed and displayed. So our current systems, of course, is not capable of doing all of that. Of course, one can do a lot of compression and things like that, but if you want to preserve all the resolution and everything else, you're gonna, you have to be able to process all that data. And uh, also, the internet that currently exists is not able to process all that, that, that fast. So we have a center that we have put together that is funded by NSF, which is called the Center for Integrated Access Network, which consists of uh, nine universities uh, that are all working together to make the internet uh, various ways to make the internet faster and uh, using optoelectronic uh, components and silicon photonics. I talked about gesture control. This is from another movie that, again, a lot of these ideas comes from different movies. People have already thought about those things. And can you actually control this by uh, using your hands rather than the camera, rather than this, uh, the, uh, the uh, computer, take the 3D image, move it around, and basically be immersed completely in that, in that 3D world. A lot of uh, software is needed for that, and several uh, software engineers are working to make this happen. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the, pre the present uh, state that we are in. Uh, the largest images are about 17 inches that we can make, and uh, the fastest that we can do that is in a few seconds right now. And the reason we cannot go faster was, is two. One is because our lasers are only 50 hertz right now. If we, wanna, if we replace the laser with a kilohertz type system, we can go with your rate. Also, you're going to need an SLM that is faster than that. And so our liquid crystal uh, SLMs are not the proper answer. So we are actually going toward uh, the Texas Instrument uh, DMDs, and those, those are the, uh, the ones that we are currently working on. So, um, the next steps, again, is going toward video rate, and that's what's happening at present time. These are the people who are working on this. Uh, we are actually collaborating closely with Nito Denko uh, Technical, which is a company, a parent company in Japan, Nito Denko. Uh, Yam Michi Yamamoto is the vice president of that company, and he was on that cover of Nature that I showed you. His people are working on this in terms of uh, the material that we have. They're making it, the formulation, and putting it into a large format is being done by them. Uh, experiments are done at uh, university by these gentlemen, and the software is done also by some of our people. OK, so this is the first part of the talk. The second part is the use of nanocarbon for mode-like fiber lasers and what we call liquid photonics. The idea here is very simple. As you may know, uh, the, one of the concepts you're looking at is to 
replace the big lasers like the Thai Sapphire laser and others that are based on free space optics and make it into a fiber. And we're focusing in this talk uh, on uh, mode lock fiber lasers, so femtosecond type fiber lasers that can sit on the palm of your hand. So these are bulky, free space, so they're usually difficult to operate and um, they're expensive. The whole idea here is that you're gonna have all fiber systems, the light doesn't get out of the fiber system, it's alignment free, it's robust, and you can have it at different wavelengths and different uh, pulse durations. So a lot of work has been done in this and uh, different dopants have been used to put inside the glass and to make it operational at various wavelengths. Uh, for example, erbium in the 1.5 XX area, uh, that's erbium uh, fiber amplifiers were the ones that started the whole communication uh, explosion that we saw in the 80s and 90s. Uh, there are other elements like neodymium, neodymium and ytterbium in the one micron range and also um, thulium and holium for the two micron range have been done before. So to do this, we have put together a fiber optic lab uh, starting from making the proper glasses, multi-component glasses. And uh, for example, if you look at the commercial erbium doped fiber, um, it has a gain of about 0.01 dB per centimeter because if you start increasing the co doping concentration to make the gain larger, you get um, the um, luminescence start being quenched because the erbium molecules gets together. And so we're using another type of glass, different types of glasses, multi-component glasses that allows us to increase the doping concentration. So we make those glasses and make it preform uh, and then have a fiber drying tower that um, we actually draw the fiber. We can make multi-core fibers, uh, microstructure fibers, and so on. And we have made different type of lasers from one micron to two micron. And then after you do all of that, you can do, we have also coding facilities that allow us to do the coding on the top of a fiber and make different type of uh, devices with that. Okay, so as you know, in, in order to make a uh, laser mode lock, you need to have at least in the uh, passive mode locking system the case, you need to have a satchel absorber inserted inside a cavity. Uh, satchel absorption is one of the applications of nonlinear optics that has been made it to the commercial products. If nonlinear optics has been around for many years, if you ask how many of the nonlinear components or uh, concepts have gone into the commercial area, uh, you can think of lasers, if you consider laser to be a nonlinear element, and uh, crystals like uh, the second harmonic uh, processes, second harmonic generation is another one, and satchel absorber is a third one. So it's an application that has made it to the commercial product. So the typical satchel absorbers that people use uh, is a CSAM or semiconductor satchel absorber that you can see here. Uh, the light gets out, goes into the uh, the, this saturated absorber mirror and comes back. And so basically, this is the saturated absorber process that you see transmission goes up or absorption goes down. So what we have done, but the, the problem is, is again, it's the reliability and also uh, the u ease of use. Uh, what we have done here is instead of the CSAM, you're using carbon nanotube as saturated absorbers. The nice thing about such is carbon nanotube is the absorption doesn't depend on wavelengths too, too large, too much, so therefore you can actually uh, tune the, the wavelength to different areas, uh, as you can see here, one to two micron, and also the uh, recovery time is very rapid, less than a picosecond, and therefore it's a good material for a saturable absorber. The process was described in this uh, paper uh, with uh, Khan Q and Mansurapur in 2007, uh, where you actually take a fiber taper and uh, put it inside the groove and then 
put this uh, polymerized version of the uh, carbon nanotube on top of it. And so fiber in and fiber out. So you can see this is when the fiber taper is being made, and that's the fiber. And that's the, uh, uh, the s s carbon nanotube. So the whole device is like this, fiber going in, fiber going out, and that's the saturated absorber. So it's very easy to, to, to do after you learn how to do it. And then it's actually pretty um, easy, s simple device. So this is an example of a cavity. You can see here, all fiber, uh, erbium dope fiber here. The, the saturated uh, nanotube, saturated absorber is here isolator and you, you pump it and you get the light out and you can get uh, short pulses out of this. We have uh, obtained pulses as short as 14 femtosecond using this system by proper, properly managing dispersion. One of the examples of such a laser is to generate white light continuum. For those of you who want to do spectroscopy and need white light, this is a very simple and inexpensive way of making white light. And as you can see here, it goes from on a very long, it's a span of long wavelength range from visible to uh, two micron in this case. We actually have systems that go all the way to four micron. So it's getting into the near infrared. And so, but it's very nice in a sense that as you can see, it's just a fiber coming out and it's showing uh, a very nice um, continuum uh, that is generated here. So this is all with these uh, carbon nanotubes. So another a platform that you would like, you wanted to use and, and operate is this called liquid core optical fiber. For those of you who have used dye lasers uh, in the past, you know that the cells are about a centimeter long and uh, you cannot make it longer because the beam gets diffracted and so uh, you lose intensity. The question was, when we started, one of our uh, research directions is to try to come up with, uh, to study uh, chi tree materials, organics with large chi trees. So our collaborators who are making these chi tree materials like Seth Marder, Joe Perry and so on at, at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, when they make these materials in the liquid form, they are rather nice and uh, the, spe the, spe the uh, spectral features are narrow, but as soon as you start making it into thin films, they become very broad, absorption goes up, and uh, it's difficult to use it for devices. So the question we asked was that, can we keep the material in the liquid form, but have interaction length larger than a centimeter? So that was the concept of putting the liquid uh, in these chi tree materials in liquid form inside a fiber and make the fiber length longer, a matter of a meter instead of a centimeter that is here. And so if you can do something like that, then you can keep the intensity very high. It can still make it single mode and still and study various materials in that format. So this is the concept of uh, angle splicing a uh, SMF fiber with a uh, hollow core uh, capillary optical fiber. You can basically uh, splice these things together. And then, uh, as you can see here, after you put the liquid in, you can cap it so that the liquid doesn't come out. And uh, you can have lengths that are on the order of half a meter to a couple of meter of fiber. It's compatible to with fiber optics, so it's easy to do. And you can have long interaction length and with high intensity that's guided inside the fiber. And so therefore, after you do that, you can imagine that you can start, you're going into low power optics uh, and low energy devices using this technology. Because in switching and so on, people are going after uh, adojoule type um, energy requirements for, for the switching, and that's one of the directions that we are going after. So let me show you a couple of examples of what we have studied in these things. Uh, Oscar mentioned about uh, 
Raman scattering. So it's, as he said, it's very simple. You put the light in at a certain frequency and you have a scattering with the vibrations inside the material or in the fiber, doesn't matter. And you get these stokes and anti-stokes with the stokes being on the low energy side of the, of the laser, anti-stokes on the high energy side of the laser. And a similar Raman scattering has a much higher efficiency and is being used mainly to generate various sources in fibers uh, that is being commercially actually available. So in that case, you put the light in and there is the interaction with the fiber, the, 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 the vibrations allows you to basically get photons out of the pump and put it into the Stokes line. And so therefore, uh, as a result of this process, you can get a similar Raman scattering and you can generate photons at frequencies below the pump and then you can have multiple of those uh, phonons being uh, interacted with and so you get a comb of uh, frequencies that you can get from this process. So is a very nice way of generating new frequencies in fiber. So one of the things we wanted to do is actually try that in our liquid core optical fiber by, by filling the, uh, the, 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 the fiber with CS2. CS2 is again one of those liquids that has been around for a long time. Various studies have been done, optical frequencies, pho phonons and all those have been well known in this material. So as you can see here, you splice it and then you make a, this is the liquid core fiber and you cap it on both sides. Then you put it inside this system, you send the light through it and you look at the SRS or stimulated Raman scattering in this. And the whole idea was that by com doing this in a liquid compared, for example, with the fiber, we expect to get a lot lower threshold, so much easier to operate, and also compare it with, for example, the hollow core optical fibers that have been filled with hydrogen, for example. That was a science paper that was published a few years back. I wanted to see how that com these things compare. The work is published recently, this year, and if you, this is some of the result of that. You can see that the pump, uh, if you get the pump at the 532 nanometer, you see a number of uh, harmonics that are coming, coming up. Uh, so therefore you generate these different frequencies from that pump. You can also do that at 1064 nanometer you can get the number of frequencies generated uh, at the harmonics uh, in that wavelength range. The nice thing about that was that it was, uh, the threshold was about a thousand times smaller than what was done in the hydrogen filled uh, fiber. So that was uh, pretty interesting to look at. Another thing that one can do is what's called the IRS or inverse Raman scattering. This is the process that was uh, discussed and invented by Boris Tochev uh, in 1964, University of uh, Toronto in Canada. So in this case, uh, pretty much what happens is that at the anti-stoke side, the photons again goes from the higher energy side to the lower energy side. So photons get removed from the anti-stoke side and gets added to the, to the pump. So basically at the anti-stoke side, you should see a reduction or absorption, uh, and that's why it's called inverse Raman scattering. So in order to do this experiment, again, this our mode-like fiber laser that includes this uh, uh, nanocarbon saturated absorber was used. It was uh, put into two parts, one part of the beam gone and generated a con super uh, continuum as a broadband source to do spectroscopy with, and the other part you put a delay line in there and uh, you put a filter and use it as a pump and then send the light through the, uh, the liquid core optical fiber and look at the inverse Raman scattering in that system. This shows the result of that. This is where the pump is 
And if you look at the phonon part in CS2, uh, you see at 668 centimeter inverse, which is the well-known uh, vibrational mode of CS2, you see a about 20 dB of, 17 and a half dB of a loss. So that's the SRS that I was talking about. At the uh, anti-stoke side, you see that uh, light is being removed and therefore you see a dip in the absorption and that's shown by this, uh, by this process here. So this can be used as switching as I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes, but uh, the interesting is that it's a, it's a uh, pretty uh, high contrast type switching that can be obtained here. The experiment was also done with CCL4, filled into optical fiber. CCL4 has a number of vibrational frequencies, and as you can see here, again, the pump here, and you see all of these vibrational modes on the anti-stoke side uh, from the CCL4, and that is also uh, easily observed. And one other thing that one can do here, if you wanna do uh, WDM, by tuning the pump frequency, you can actually see the different uh, uh, sides coming in. Okay, a couple of minutes left. Let me, we have done some optical uh, switching with this and to that basically shows one beam loses energy, the other beam gains energy. Uh, but uh, what we have also looked at is what's called IBS, inverse Brillouin scattering. In the case of Brillouin scattering, the um, acoustic phonons are involved in the process. In the case of Raman scattering, of course, optical phonons are involved. So acoustic phonons have much lower in energy and therefore the separation of the energy uh, the separation of uh, yeah, wavelengths of the, of the uh, pump photon and that difference in energy um, is pretty small so that you can actually think of even add a joule type of uh, uh, energy loss in a switch. So the experiment was done very easily again, as you can see here, you can send the pump and probe from both sides into liquid core fiber and you can see very nicely that the, uh, this is the uh, Stoke sign, and you see the uh, stimulated Raman, uh, it's a stimulated Brillouin gain, and in this side, stimulated Brillouin loss on the anti-Stoke side, so um, that can be obtained, uh, can be observed nicely here in a 60 centimeter type uh, fiber. This was a poster line at the, at the Clio this year. And one can also uh, make a laser with that, again, in the very simple, uh, system like this, you can get lasing happening here. Okay, I'm done. And this is my collaborators here, as I've shown here. Uh, Khan Q has just been hired as an assistant professor uh, in our uh, department. And a number of students, one has been graduated, the other one's in the process. Uh, they're working on this. And finally, summary, I talked about 3D technology. I talked about liquid core fibers. And what we are now doing is trying to integrate all of this on a chip. And so the integration of this IBS and IRS instead of in a fiber, in a chip uh, process. And that's what we're working at present time. Thanks very much for your attention.